morning, Ron. Good morning. A nice intimate conversation with a few friends. <laughs> uh, I love university life. One of the things about it that's so exciting is, um, boy, there's just, your life is chock full of ideas and opportunities to hear interesting people and uh, do and see interesting things. And every once in a while, a university affords its community an opportunity to uh, encounter something really extraordinary. And so for those of you, I'm not talking to Ron now, but for the rest of us, today is one of those, is one of those days. Truly extraordinary. Um, I'm going to embarrass our guest. Ron Anson was born in Omaha, Nebraska. He earned an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts, from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Now that program is commonly regarded as uh, the best program in creative writing in North America. Uh, so the very top of the heap. He held a Wallace Stegner Creative Writing Fellowship at Stanford University. Earned an MA in Spirituality from the University of Santa Clara. Received fellowships from the Michigan Society of Fellows, the National Endowment for the Arts, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, and the Lyndhurst Foundation. He received the award in literature from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. He was twice a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award and once for the National Book Award. These two awards, I think, are at the absolute summit of, uh, of what uh, is, is uh, opposite to the American uh, literary enterprise. So these are like the, you know, the Oscars of literature. So I want you just to take that in. This is a person of, 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 of real gravitas and it's an honor for us to have him here. But the other thing that you ought to know is that um, Ron Hansen wears all that lightly. He is a ardent, disciple of Jesus Christ himself, and it's an honor to have you here. So can Thank we you. welcome him? Thank you. Thank you a lot. So, um, so here's a real easy question. Uh, I hope they're all easy. Uh, how many novels have you written? Um, I've published nine, and uh, I have some that I haven't published yet. Okay. Um, and I have two books of stories, and a children's book, and a book of essays. Okay. So nine novels, some waiting, and then a couple other. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you once wrote that writing can be a sacramental enterprise. What did you mean by that? Uh, I, I hearken back to the old idea of what a sacrament really is. It's a witness of God's grace in your life. And I think that uh, any creative enterprise directed toward God, or being an instrument of God's will, can be a sacramental act, that uh, God speaks to us in so many different ways and speaks to others in so many different ways. It, sometimes it's through prayer, but sometimes it's through art. Sometimes it's through nature. Uh, uh, that, I think it was Augustine who says, our hearts are re restless until we rest in thee. So we're constantly looking for other ways to find manifestations of God and also to hear God's message to us, to us and um, that's the cause of restlessness because we can't find it in any one place. Um, and uh, for me, writing art uh, is a way of uh, registering what my prayer is like. I was once asked what, how writing and prayer are different and I, I couldn't identify how they were different because when I pray, when I'm writing, it feels the same way and uh, I think God speaks to me sometimes through my writing, sometimes through my prayer, and sometimes in other ways. Okay. Um, so, y y your first two novels were uh, actually about, uh, uh, I think, 18th century American 19th West. Century. 19th century American right. West. Um, yeah. So, one on the James Gang and one on... The Dalton Gang. I mean, the, yeah, the yeah. Dalton Gang, one on Jesse... Jesse James, James. and Bob Ford, yeah. yeah. That was, Which was made into a movie starring yeah. Brad Pitt. The Assassination the of Jesse James by the card Robert Ford. Yeah. yeah. So yeah I, had, I just uh, had uh, lunch with Casey Affleck on Sunday, and he, and he said, every actor looks for a role that will be defining, and he's had his. He thought that his Bob Ford was going to be the one, the one that defined him, and he was happy about that. It's not like it was limited in any way, but yeah. I was really proud to hear that. But you've also written um, a book called Exiles. Yes a book with the title Hitler's Niece, yeah. 
and, uh, and then the book you're going to read from later on today, right. Atticus. So yes. maybe talk a little bit about the origin of those stories and what, okay. and what prompted you to write them. Um, Exiles was a long time brewing. I was, it, Exiles is about Gerard Manley Hopkins, a British poet in, the 19, in 19th century England, who is, was a brilliant poet, but none of his poems were published in his lifetime. He died of typhoid in 1889, feeling like a total failure. Uh, but by 1918, uh, his, those poems were collected and published, and then they re reached incredible success. Um, and till now, uh, people think, most poets think of him as the best poet since John Keats. Um, and I was struck by that, that he felt like a total failure, but one of his, he went on a retreat toward the end of his life, and he prayed that God would somehow use his po poems and take care of it. So he died, and by his last words on his deathbed were, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. And I thought that was a wonderful affirmation of religious faith and maybe a foretaste of heaven. But also I thought that so many people labor in obscurity or they labor with a sense of failure. And that Hopkins for me was kind of a model of a person who just accepted and trusted in God and found the results far after, long after his death. So that was, and then the, the book is also about <laughs> five, uh, Catholic nuns were exiled from Germany during Otto von Bismarck's uh, culture conf. He wanted to get rid of all religion, and he decided to go for the religious orders first. Of course, Hitler followed him. Um, they were heading to Missouri to work in an orphanage, and on the ship, it foundered off the coast of uh, England, and they were swept, either swept away at sea or they drowned on board the ship, all five nuns. So they felt like utter failures themselves. And I thought they were kind of a perfect metaphor for Hopkins' own life. Uh, Atticus was born out of my experience living in Mexico one summer. Um, a lot of strange things happened. I saw a man walking around with a, a d detective, it seemed like, and they were going to various uh, Posadas and ask, showing a picture of a girl and asking if this person had seen her. She was obviously an American who'd been lost on there. And I was really struck by that. And then uh, a person I knew got in a fight with somebody and just punched him once, but the guy hit his head on cobblestones and died. Mm. And so this guy put the body in a Volkswagen and drove all the way to Cuernavaca to deposit the body somewhere. And then discovered uh, that he was doing the wrong thing, so he went back, turned himself in, and was put in jail. And one of my friends went to visit him and said, this is terrible, what's happened to you? And he says, you know, it's not so bad. My maid still comes and brings me food. I have friends here, I'm teaching them English, I'm teaching them chess. This may be the happiest I've been. And I was really struck by that. And so I combined those two things with some other experiences and came up with uh, Atticus. I wanted to have in Atticus a figure of God walking the earth. And I wanted to have in his son, Scott, who's kind of a rogue living in Mexico, uh, an example of the prodigal son. And of course, prodigal father, prodigal son. Uh, so those were kind of coherent. Um, oh, Hitler's niece. Um, in one of my meditations, I, I meditated on how Jesus calls us and seduces us. And then how Satan does that, calls us mm -hmm. and seduces us and offers us um, vanities. Um, and so I thought of Satan, uh, his representative on earth was Hitler. And I had it, uh, Hitler really was in love with his niece and, only, and actually wanted to marry her. But then she was found dead in his apartment. And it's long been thought that, uh, well, he, it was claimed early on that she committed suicide, but now it's thought that she was murdered by Hitler or one of his minions. And I thought of uh, presenting Hitler as a satanic person who woos all of Germany and can dis, uh, changes it, basically, makes it uh, kind of an evil empire. And how uh, Gailey herself is at first seduced by his flattery and gifts and all those things, but then sees at the core of Hitler evil. So it's a meditation on evil more than anything else. Thank you. Um, you weave together in your work themes such as redemption, hardship, what 
you know, James calls uh, trials of many kinds, mm -hmm. um, grace and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Can you reflect on, on, on those themes for us a little bit? Yeah, I think um, I was thinking about my books this morning, trying to find some unifying thing. There's two unifying things. Um, they're about outlaws of many kinds, either real criminals or people who just step outside the usual boundaries. Uh, so it's in I, one of my novels is called Mariette in Ecstasy, about a young woman who enters, enters a convent and uh, gets the stigmata. And I thought the idea of going into a cloistered situation, entering religion, deeply devout religious life, all those things were an example of outlawry. And also another theme is about failure. Um, almost all my characters fail in some way, uh, at least as far as they're concerned, but it doesn't always turn out to be failure ultimately. Um, Jesse James was a failure um, and died. Bob Ford wanted to become a great figure and, and died as a reviled coward. Um, all of them have to, it, it's in the nature of plots to have problems. And so it's in the nature of nar narratives to throw obstacles in front of the protagonists, or their heroes and heroines, and uh, they either o overcome them or they succumb to those obstacles. And uh, that's kind of the Christian passage. Uh, we face sin, we face our own flaws or addictions or problems in our lives, and count on the grace of God to pull us through. So and that's, that's where the redemption comes in. There's a redemption, as you know, at the end of Atticus, where Scott and his father are unified. Um, and it, for me, that was a uh, message not only of Jesus on earth with us, but of God in our, his relationship with us too. It seems to me you're also trying to say something to Americans and American culture. And um, like what is it that maybe we have forgotten yeah. about ourselves or about faith and God that you're trying to, of which you're trying to remind us and to, and to which you want to call us back? You know, I liken it to, the, I think people with a strong religious faith see in color and other people see in black and white. We're just aware of a bigger range of things going on and we see the relationships between things. Uh, we see God's personality revealed in so many different ways and other people are very, they're very sequestered and limited, I think, if they don't have religious faith. They, they're not stepping outside themselves, they're always within themselves or just with their friends and family, uh, but not reaching beyond that other level, not seeing the supernatural. Uh, and, and its evidence in nature and other things. And m maybe one last question. How do you, um, what are you trying to say about human nature in your, in your work? I think, um, I think it can be perfected. Um, not that it is always going to be completely perfect, but uh, it, it's perfected at least in heaven. Uh -huh. uh, and we deal with imperfections right now. And I think through the grace of God, we get rid of some of those imperfections. We're always going to be carrying something with us. But um, the idea of, of sin and forgiveness is really important in my work. And the idea of how religious insight isn't always rewarded. Um, mm. In fact, it's sometimes rebuked or put down. I was, I was just reminded uh, there was a movie called Memphis Bell and yeah. all these, set in World War II yeah. on a B-17, and a guy was reading the <coughs> roster of the people who were getting on the plane, be on the plane, and then he pointed to one guy and he said, oh, there is always at least one religious nut. And I thought how untrue that was, especially in that period. All those people fighting in World War II were religious in certain ways. Their the rarity was the atheist. And they, you know that old expression, there's no atheists in foxholes, uh, because, uh, they're always begging for God's mercy and God's help uh, to get out of this fight. Um, I, th I think that that's been magnified in our century, that uh, the idea that if you're religious, you're on the fringe, and if you're non-religious, you've wised up, and I think that needs to be reversed. Well, um, 
I think I'm going to be quiet now and let you read okay. from Atticus and go ahead and right. introduce it for our students. Okay. As I said, this is um, kind of a spirit of God walking on earth. Um, Atticus, I modeled after my grandfather. His name was Frank Salvador, lived in eastern Colorado. Um, his son, Scott Cody, is living in Mexico. He's an artist. He's had psychological problems in his past. Um, he was very easy to write because he's very much based on me, even though I haven't had those psychological problems, but I've had the spirit of the rogue at times. Um, and he, he's living there on an inheritance. He's got a brother who's a state senator that his father is proud of. Uh, Scott feels like the prodigal son, the, the, the guy who's not doing well at all. Atticus gets word that his son has committed suicide. So he goes from Colorado to Mexico to recover the body. Because of Mexican regulations, he can't for a number of days. So he's waiting to recover the body and fly it back to Colorado when he discovers a number of clues that seem to indicate that his son was murdered. And so he becomes kind of a detective in pursuit of who the murderer was and why his son was murdered. And this is a spoiler alert, but uh, at a critical juncture in the book, uh, he finds his son in the basement of a church uh, where he's been hiding out. That person that Atticus saw in the coffin wasn't his son. It was somebody who looked like him. And it, they don't have embalming, so by the time Atticus saw his, what he thought was his son, uh, he was uh, gradually being destroyed by the maggots and so forth. Um, there's a, a woman down in, in Mexico whose name is Renata, and she was in a Hirsch clinic with him, in a psychiatric clinic with him, and they became friends. Uh, Renata is married to somebody named Stuart. The person who is dead and in that coffin was called Reinhardt, Reinhardt Schmidt. And when I was in Mexico, I was at a market once, and I, met, I saw this German guy, and he bought something, and they brought it over the package to me because they thought I, would, I looked exactly the same. We don't, didn't look exactly the same except we both were blue-eyed and Anglos. And, um, so I, thought, I saw how easy it is that people could get confused. Um, the, the last section of this novel is called The House of He Who Invents Himself, which was originally the title for this novel, but people had trouble with the pronouns. But I liked it because that's the Mayan word for church the house of he who invents himself. And I like the idea of God as the person who invents himself. I'm going to read just a couple of short passages here. This is from Scott's voice. Um, half the book is you're following Atticus, and another half is uh, Scott telling what actually happened. Because it's kind of a mystery, but I wanted to, wanted to avoid the Agatha Christie thing of having every, all the principles in the room and having Atticus point out what actually happened, so I had Scott, Scott do that. It's the parable of the prodigal son, isn't it? There was a cattleman without cattle who had two sons, and the kid brother went to his father and asked for his inheritance, and his father divided his estate between his sons so he wouldn't go crazy with worry. And not many days later, the one who thought much of himself gathered everything he owned and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his inheritance in wild living. And when he had wasted everything, he began to be in want. And he took a job in the fields feeding swine. But when he came to his senses, he said, I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. And he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran out and embraced him and kissed him. Luke chapter 15. And this is uh, later where he discovers, he, he watches from afar as his father is in pursuit of his murderer. I frankly admit it, hot tears filled my eyes. My father was fact conscious conscious, observant, even an omni sometimes, but his fragmented pieces together of what had happened Wednesday night was far less impressive to me than that he'd so 
relentlessly sought a solution. I felt humiliatingly unequal to his faithfulness, his loyalty, his love, as if I were heir to some foreign genes that my father had no part in. I hit the hood, light to turn it off, and in full fashion, in full, full, full fashion, hit the hood vent in, fan instead, hitting it off again after half a second, then hitting the light switch too. But the fan roar had been enough. I held myself still and heard the floor creak under his feet, saw the hallway flush with light, and then heard Atticus walk the upstairs, hunting the stranger who woke him. I hurried out of the house and hushed closed the pool door, and then I just stood far away by a tide pool, fixing my gaze on the upper rooms as my father washed and dressed, fixing my gaze on the kitchen window as he ate a bowl of cornflakes by the sink. Atticus heaved the pool door and hammered it shut, and I held my position out of his sight as he walked past, half smiling for once, with a radiola playing the frantically cheerful mariachi music on my homemade Linda Ronstadt tape. I heard no more. I got out of there, hurtling through sand and high grasses to the avenida, and then walking in the faint gray of pre-dawn until I was in the centro. Had a flan and Nescafe at a hole in the wall behind the parroquia. But as I sat there trying to read a, a found newspaper, all I could think of was my father, my pursuer, hunting down clues to my murder. Look at what you're putting him through. You can't go on like this. At 10, I walked across the public square, ambling under the loggia and right inside Printer's Inc. Renata was stocking paper backs in a bookcase, but she let them flop to the floor in her shock at finding me there. She glanced to the bookstore office. Stuart, her husband, was fully absorbed and fiddling with his computer. Are you crazy? Worn out. You heard about Ronaldo. I felt I was falling. What now? She told me Ronaldo Cruz was shot with his own gun in his uncle's Bella Vista bar after Ronaldo Rinaldo had harangued Raphael for half the night and finally insulted his wife. Self-defense, the police called it. But it was suicide, she said. My mother first, then Carmen Martinez, Reinhard Schmidt, Rinaldo Cruz. I forced open a pocket knife of a smile. Who's next? She walks, walked forward and fell into me with a kind of relief, holding whatever affection and faithful faithfulness she had hard against me, her face firmly pressed to my chest, inhaling the smell of my hand-me-down shirt. She told me that the friends of Colorado State Senator Frank Cody got through the Mexican bureaucracy far better than Stewart could have, and that Reinhard Schmidt was being exhumed in an hour or so in preparation for his shipment to Colorado. She and Stewart would have to be there to identify the remains. Tell them it isn't me. I have two gold fillings in my teeth. Reinhardt doesn't. You can say you just remembered. Oh, Scott, are you sure? I'll be fine, I said. Well, where will you go? To jail, probably. Without turning, Stuart called from the office, Renata, who's there with you? I held her face in my hand. Kiss me, I said, and she did. I felt the fleeting, soft give of her mouth against mine, and then I walked out the front door. Sergeant Espinosa, my old friend from my Baracho days, was sitting on the front steps of the police station, and he stood up with concern when he saw my face. But a Marriott van full of fresh tourists halted in the street, separating us, and when Espinosa got around it, I had disappeared underground. Then I waited. It was the one good and tenacious thing I'd done, that waiting. I handed out my sunglasses, bandana, and frayed cowboy hat to whomever could take them, and watched Stuart's beggar go out for his rounds in my gray Stanford t-shirt. Cicadas churred in the hedges outside. A gray scorpion inched up an adobe wall and curled its poisonous tail in defense when I lightly tapped its head with a pen. A hunched old woman shuffled by as if her sole purpose was to stir up the fine powdered earth with her shoes. An hour passed, then half an hour of another. Even in daylight, the great room was all shade and absence as if spirit and qualities had been subtracted from it. You'd paint it in fun funeral black, raw umber, sienna brown, vermilion, Caravaggio colors, colors of loss and impermanence. 
I was in the belly of the whale. I was with Lazarus in the tomb. A hard rain of sunlight cheated in when the first floor door opened. And Atticus was there, just as I knew he would be, his face full of pursuit and worry. His hand flowed along the railing as he found his way down into that huge sepulcher and walked uncertainly across the floor, his head turning right and left as he took in the underworld all around him. I got to my feet, got over against a wall, still unsure if I would be willing to talk to him or be seen. But there was a kindliness to him, that you okay look, and I found it in me to walk forward. And I asked, will you forgive me? And I felt forgiven even as I said it. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I, I, I've bought, I think, 50 copies of that book over the last 15 years. Uh, and hand out to, for, well, I buy them used, so it's not <laughs> help. You can buy them for $1.39 on bookfinder.com and uh, get them delivered to you. But I give these to, to folks all the time. I've got seven in my office right now if you want one. Uh, it's, a, it's a, a book of luminous power, and it does express the gospel in ways that the culture can understand. And uh, we are honored to have you with us, Ron. Thank you. Why don't we stand as we uh, close in prayer? You, a God, are a God of revelation. You seek to make your face and your presence and your will known. And we thank you for our guest, uh, our friend, our brother in Christ, Ron Hansen, and for his faithfulness to your call and for his use of, of the gifts you've given him. And uh, help us to understand and discern the gifts you have placed in each one of us and give us a desire to be faithful to your call. These things we pray and all God's people said, Amen. you're dismissed. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.